Um, so up till now, we've learned about database design theory. We've learned about data types. We've learned about different diagramming tools. We've learned how what relationships are and whatnot. Now, starting this week, we're jumping into the communicating with the database. So you guys have learned, are learning Java as a programming language. You're about to learn another programming language. I hate using the phrase programming language because the language you use to speak to databases isn't a programming language per se. It's a querying language. It's a, it's a method of writing up questions to the server. And what I'm covering this week specifically is the introduction to something called SQL. There's going to be a one slide history lesson. Then I'm going to talk about something called DDL, which I talk about, I explain what that is in a few moments. Um, I'll be teaching you guys about insert, update, and deletes. And then I'm going to cover the very most basic select statement. Yes? It's week five. The one that's uploaded says week four because I just noticed it said week four when I turned it on here. Uh, the file is named correctly. It used to be my week four lecture when I didn't cover quite as much theory. So you guys are right where you're supposed to be. Uh, by the, also, the other guys usually had their first assignment by now. So you guys get your assignment a week later, which isn't bad. Just means you got more theory to actually do the work right. Okay. I'm going to start with the history lesson. SQL is a special purpose programming language. It was designed to do one thing. Now, what, this is where I make a uh, differentiation between special purpose and general purpose languages. A general purpose language is like Java or PHP or C. You can write programs to do all kinds of things with it. A special purpose language is a language that's been created to do one thing and do it well. SQL was created to talk to databases. There's a programming language out there called R. I don't know if anybody here has ever heard of R. It's for doing statistics. It's basically a very math intensive language. It optimizes math operations. If I even remember it using reverse Polish notation for its math equations. So it's a specialty purpose language. SQL is a specialty purpose language. Now, it was created by IBM in the early 70s. So this goes to show how long this language has been around. Not as long as C, not as long as BASIC or Fortran, but it's been around longer than pretty much every other language other than those four. It was originally called SQL, Structured English Query Language. Thus the stupid pronunciation of SQL as SQL. By the way, that really pisses me off. Um, the IBM had to change the name to SQL because they infringed somebody else's trademark without realizing it. There was another company, I don't remember what they were called because they don't exist anymore, but they had a product to deal with databases called SQL. Spelt the exact same way. Um, SQL is what they call an initialism, not an acronym. Uh, not an acronym. It's not pronounceable. So it's SQL, just saying. Now, the first commercial version was Oracle that had it, Oracle 2. And specifically, it was Oracle 2 for the VAX. Now, most of you are too young to know about the VAX. The VAX computers were these machines created by a company called Digital Equipment. If anybody's been in Ottawa their entire lives, you might have heard about Digital Equipment. They were one of the uh, big IT companies up there with Nortel and a few others. That, um, whatever one that's, that got bought up by IBM that used to do reporting. Anyways, I can't name, remember the name of the company. It was a, one of the jewels of the Ottawa Valley. Anyways, um, the VAX computers were really powerful computers for the time. They were the size of two desks this size put together. Uh, they were practically impossible to break. Uh, often the solution to fix why it wasn't working is you kicked it. I kick you, I kid you not. Seriously, like it would tang and you just go kick the box. It would loosen everything up again and then it would, re and everything would start come back from the dead. It was an amazing machine. Um, 
Actually, I think the school here still has a couple of systems running on old VAX computers. Why? Because they work. The first standard was established in 1986, so it took about 16, 14 to 16 years for an official standard to be established. And it's called SQL 86, and they're so original in how they do their naming for those standards. Um, essentially, every time they come up with a new standard, they just tack on the last two years of the, the last two numbers of the year. And SQL 86 established the basic concepts of SQL. In 1999, the 1999 standard, also known as SQL 99, like I said, they're really original. Um, this is when there was major changes to the rules, and this is the standard that we now use nowadays. Um, there have been more standards coming out, but most database servers say they support SQL 99 as their base standard. So as you can see, you're all learning a standard that's now 17, 18 years out of date. Um, that's not that it's out of date, it's just it was pretty much good. And the stuff they've added since is extra functionality for special purposes for data warehousing and stuff. So nothing fantastic has been added to it. Um, 86? That's, there's no learning curve. It's the same language. Um, essentially, the biggest changes that happened in 99 is uh, they now support regular expressions. Um, that M should be a comma. I say that every time I use this slide. It should be regex, not regex M. Uh, recursion, which is a really complicated topic. Um, I don't know. If, when you guys learn about recursive functions, you'll understand why it's complicated. Because you can't understand recursion until you understand recursion. It's true. You can't understand it until you understand it. It's one of those stupid things. <laughs> it is. Um, and they included something called triggers. That's when the standard for triggers was put in. Before that, everybody did triggers, but they all did it kind of weird their own way. But there was a standard of, you know, these are the things you should be able to do. Uh, 2003 and 2006, they introduced X XML. Uh, yay. Uh, considering XML is pretty much dead as a doorknob now. Uh, so they actually created two whole standards based on XML, and now XML is barely used. That's what I'm saying. You know, after 99, there's not a lot that was worthwhile. Uh, in 2008, they added the official, they created a command called truncate officially. All the servers had it before that, but they made it official. Remember when I was talking about de facto naming standards? So that was a de facto command everybody had to have, and they finally made it part of the standard. Um, there's something in there up there that says instead of. This is part of the triggers. So when I talk about triggers, I'll talk about instead of. And currently we're sitting, at least as of when I wrote this slide, uh, SQL 2011. I can't tell you what's new in 2011. They talk about uh, window functions and this and that and the other thing. And like I said, that's all for data warehousing purposes. It serves no purpose unless you're dealing with tens of, thousands, tens of millions of rows of data, which you won't be in this course. I don't think you'll deal with tens of millions of rows at all if you're Algonquin. Just putting it out there. All right. SQL. SQL is a three-part language. It's kind of odd in the sense that those that have played with programming languages, basically you learn Java, you learn Java. There isn't three parts to Java. There's Java with all the bits and pieces that make it up. SQL was basically designed, and I'm pretty sure by a bunch of guys sitting in separate rooms, not communicating with each other. So you got the three core pieces. There's the DDL, the data definition language. Its purpose in life is to actually maintain the structure of the database. You know when you guys were doing your physical diagrams last week in lab? And then some of you got clever and they actually looked at the SQL preview and you saw a bunch of commands? Those are the commands that are used to create the structure. You can type those in by hand which you will be. But you type those in by hand. And you can create objects on the fly. You can also use those commands to change, add a field, remove a field, change some default values, rename objects. That's what, it, that's what the DDL is for, data, data definition. Then there's something called DML, data manipulation language. 
That's where you create and maintain data. So that's part two of the language. Essentially, there's a series of commands that let you pull data out, change the data, everything you normally do. And it's basically the implementation of an acronym called CRUD. C-R-U-D, just like CRUD. Create, retrieve, update, and delete. Those are the you know, little bits and pieces of the DML. Then there's the data control language. That's the security side of the deal. We will cover zero of that part of the language. That's a database administration course. If you're interested in that stuff, go to my YouTube channel and look at the 8250 lectures. I show how to do it with MySQL, about how to create users and drop users. But it's done using MySQL, not Postgres, but the concepts are all roughly the same. Okay. The language itself is case insensitive. So that's the good news. Language is case insensitive. It doesn't care if you type commands uppercase, lowercase. Depending on the database server you're using, object names and the data is usually case sensitive. So the stuff you put into the database is case sensitive. The structure you can be depending. With Postgres it is 100% case sensitive all the way through. With MySQL, depends if you're running on Linux, Mac, or Windows. It also depends what features you have turned on in your configuration files. Sometimes it's case sensitive, sometimes it's not. So, which leads me to the statement of always assume it's case sensitive, you'll have fewer problems that way. Right? Just assume the worst case, which is case sensitive, and just go that way. It uses spaces as keyword delimiters. So, you know, in Java, it really doesn't care about white space, right? Except for a few odd spots. You know, you can write your a for, sta a for loop. I don't know if you've learned about loops yet, but no, okay. Damn, it's hard using that example. Okay, technically with Java, you can write everything on one single line of code with semicolons and have minimal amount of spaces in there. It doesn't care. With SQL, it's a very English language. Some of the commands read like an English sentence almost. And what do we use in the English language as a word separator? Spaces. Most languages use a space. Other languages don't use spaces. They use other stuff. Um, but there are the delimiters which is spaces, which tells which brings me back to why we don't name our database object with spaces. Because it's going to think you're talking about two different things if there's a space in there. The command terminator is a semicolon. That is something you don't need to learn by now. Hopefully in Java you've gotten to the point where you know what the semicolon does. And if you're on week five and you still don't know what the semicolon does in Java, you're probably in trouble. Um, the same applies to this. Now, the big difference is if you're only running one command, because this isn't like Java where you'll write you know, 50 lines of code, then hit run. You write one command, you hit run. Then it runs. Then you write another command, you hit run, then it runs. Each command is run independently of all the others. And the if you're only running one command, so for example, you pull up uh, PG admin, you hit the SQL window to go type in your SQL commands, then you only type in one command and you don't include the semicolon, it will run. Now if you type in two commands and you forget your semicolons, what do you get? An error. So, yeah, semicolons are important, but only if you're running more than one command. Okay, now as a rule of thumb, I'm not a syntax instructor. I don't teach syntax. I teach the concepts behind it and why you want to use it. I have included on Blackboard two links in the course of documents. I, I mentioned them in the announcement I sent out today. How many of you have actually read the announcement for today? The rest of you, you should go read it. See, I love being ignored. It's like talking to my own kids. Half of them listen, half of them ignore me. So, I've provided two links. They're tutorials. One's interactive, 
where you can type in commands and it shows you if you got it right or not. And it covers the entirety of everything you need to know for this course. The other one covers pretty much everything for Postgres in detail. Um, they're both useful. They cover different aspects of the language. Um, therefore, I will cover the basic concepts of the language. I do expect you guys to actually go do a little reading on your own. So the DDL, which is the first command, is made up of three commands. There's create, alter, and drop. Create allows you to create objects. Alter lets you change it. Drop, well, allows you to get rid of it. The language is pretty straightforward. The commands do exactly what you think they're going to do. Um, now, the create command, I actually do show an example. The create command is used to create database objects. The syntax is usually pretty straightforward. And the command is create, what do you want to create? Then you give it a name. And then this is where, remember earlier I was talking about how it seemed that this language is designed by a bunch of guys all sitting in separate rooms? What comes after the name is different for pretty much everything you're dealing with. Which is why I don't teach the syntax because with Postgres, Postgres has uh, last time I counted 29 different database type objects, I had to teach you the commands for 29 different things. Whereas really all you need for this course is two. One you're going to learn in four weeks, one you're going to learn about right now. So, as I said, the definition syntax fluctuates but depending on what's being created. Most commonly used is table creation. So, let's turn the camera so it's pointing towards me. Here's the create. When am I creating a table? There's the name of the object. Notice I made it lowercase. Why? Because I told you to. So create table test. You'll see a pair of, and I always get flamed on this one. I call them brackets. Apparently the parentheses. Whatever. The round brackets. Between the round brackets, is the definition for the contents of the table, the structure of the table. So you know last week when you were using Vertebello and you were adding a field and you go add a new field, then you made it a big serial and you marked off the primary key checkbox. You called it ID. The syntax is as follows. Field name, data type, modifiers. Now this one here, this primary key statement here, is left over from SQL 86. It's the shortcut, <coughs> which I prefer. Why? Because it's obvious. Right? If you write a, create a field called ID and you make it a big serial and you say right away to the primary key, it's obvious in your declaration what that is. Um, the new one down here has like new extra things you add to the bottom, like some command called constraint. I like this one because it's easy to read. I use, I still use the syntax when I create things by hand. So, you know, it works. Then you'll see there's a comma. Next one is name. It's a varcar 50. That looks familiar from Vertebello. And I marked it as not null. You know when you hit that little N checkbox? That basically says not in, uh, value is required, not null. This is the actual, this is what it generates, is this word here. I got another comma. I call this one active. It's a Boolean. Again, it's not null. But something I haven't taught you guys yet, which is the, word, the keyword default. And it defaults to true. Anybody want to take a guess what default does? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, as the SQL language is actually fairly obvious unto itself, uh, the only catch you have is remembering the weird little syntaxes. The actual language itself is easy to understand. It's the syntax that where all the gotchas are. Because you'll notice at the end, I don't have another comma. So I can guarantee in the next set of labs, I'll have at least 12 people come to me and say, I don't know why this is running. And I'll look over at the last line, there'll be a comma. So comma between the objects, uh, between the, the fields, but no comma at the end. You close your bracket, you throw in a semicolon, you hit run and you have table. This table is now empty. 
It has three columns or fields, depending on what word you want to use. Columns and fields, same thing as an attribute. One called ID, one called name, and one called active. ID is a, is a big serial. Names of our card means it'll hold up to 50 characters, varying length. And then the last one's a Boolean, which is defaulting to true. Now, this is where I also highlight something special about Booleans. It's not on a note, I just mentioned it on the way by. Now, in the real world, when you have a Boolean situation, what does that mean? It's true, or yes or no, right? True or false. Databases have three versions of Boolean. Yes, no, and I don't know. No, really, those are the three choices, right? Yes is true, no is false, null is I don't know. Now, to avoid I don't know, you set a default value so it always has something that goes in. In other words, if you don't provide a value for this, it always defaults to whatever you set the default to. Realistically, I don't know as a Boolean is a bad thing, um, unless that's something you actually want to achieve, but you don't want to go and achieve I don't knows as much as humanly possible. At the bottom of the slide, and since the slide shows up there, there's a link to the syntax. You can see the entire syntax of the create table command at Postgres. And I'm going to use the standard because I know some people are about to go click on it. Now I'll see people go <gasps> when they see that this page printed would be about 20 pages long. I just summarized 20 pages in one slide. Um, there's a lot that you can do with a database table. And the syntax is insane. This will cover you 90% of the time. The other stuff is for the other 10% of the time. Yes, I got two questions. You spoke first. Go. Not necessarily, because I could default it to false. Not in all forces of value. This one makes sure you don't need to provide it. It's a bit like asking your significant other what they want for supper and you don't let them say you choose. And this applies to men and women, okay? Just saying. This is just making sure that there is always value provided and if they don't provide a value, you don't get an error. So it's preemptive. No, uh, if you took this, this, saved it as a text file, and then did an import, it would create a table. There's an import script, create, into a text editor, and then brought it in. Yes, you could import it in. Hey? No. No. Other, some other database tools will let you, but most design tools don't. The design tools assumes either A, you're going to connect to a database server, or B, you're back, you're reverse engineering from a file. Um, it's kind of pointless to type these commands in and then generate tables. I have seen one web tool that does the, literally that. You type it in, then it draws the diagram as you type the commands in. I always thought that was kind of backwards. But, you know, it's one of those things. All right. Any more questions about create before I move to the next one? No. Okay. The next one is alter. Alter is used to change the definition of objects. Now, changing the definition of objects means many different things. If you are working with a table, that means you could be renaming the table adding a column, dropping a column, renaming a column, changing the data type of a column, changing the default, making it null or not null. I'm just, you know, I just finished naming eight things you can do to a table, adding extra constraints, creating indexes, that kind of stuff. You know, I'm up to 10 now. And there's some of these commands for pretty much every object in a database server. And the syntax is different for every freaking object. Just putting it out there. Um, 
So when you're working with tables, you can add, rename, and remove columns. You can also rename the table. Um, as I said before, the syntax varies object by object. Uh, you'll definitely want to go and look up the syntax for the alter table command. Um, depending on how long this goes, up, the today's lecture goes, I'll actually do a quick little demo about create, alter, and drop. So you have an idea of what it looks like. And you'll see me stumble and fight with the syntax because that's life. All right, drop. Drop is the easiest one to remember. Go figure. The nuke command is the easiest one to remember. It's the same syntax for pretty much everything. Drop, give it a name. Um, or drop, table, table name, drop, whatever, and it just goes away. It's very quick, very straightforward. The syntax for drop does vary a little bit from database, some database servers. Some of them require you to identify what kind of object you're dealing with. Some don't. That's why I didn't put the syntax there about specific to the language. Um, there's really not much to say about it other than you type in drop, object name, semicolon, enter. Which leads me to the biggest gotcha of database servers. I'll give you three guesses what a database server does not have. Something that all of you are so used to using. Not restore. Oh, yeah, the restore, yeah, they got that if you have a backup. But before you need to restore, what would be the other choice you'd have? That's the one. There's no undo. You type in a command and you get it wrong, TFB. Uh, now you're writing a new command to fix what you broke. Or you're restoring from a backup. Uh, so far that I've seen, Oracle's the only one has an undo functionality. And it's horrific to use. It takes about 20 minutes to set up per table. And it quadruples the space usage on disk. It keeps deltas of every change you make. And you have to replay in reverse order everything you did. It's terrible. But it's the only database server that offers this, which is one of the reasons why Oracle's still around. It's good for the government because people screw up all the time. Yeah, that, that's totally believable. Um, well, not necessarily. That's just bad. That they don't have backups. So this is my warning. When you work with a database server and you're typing commands, by, commands in by hand, you will get zero chance to recover your mistakes. That's not all doom and gloom. I'm just warning you now. You'll just get really comfortable with fixing your mistakes and restoring databases. Depending if you're, if you're one of the people who tend to make a lot of little mistakes and you end up having to fix them a lot, you get really good at fixing database server mistakes. Um, when it comes to structure, if you added a column by accident, that's not a problem. If you renamed a column, that's okay. If you dropped a column and it was full of data, that data is gone forever. So, you know, it's, it's not quite like taking some papers and throwing them in the garbage can. It's like putting the papers in the garbage can, filling it full of lighter fluid and dropping a match. It's poof, gone. So, you know, it sounds like a terrible warning and terrible doom and gloom, but, you know, that's life. Um, there's just no undo. Okay. Why is that? Because it's transactional in nature. Okay. You inserted a row. She inserts a row. He deletes a row. You need to undo your change. How the heck can that happen? It can't. Which is why I was talking about Oracle, where it actually, what it's going to do is actually replay his change and replay her change to give you yours back, but now they've lost theirs also. So that means you've actually got data loss to recover your mistake. That's why there's no undo. Because it's, the fact that Oracle even allows it gives me the heebie-jeebies. 
and which is why they've made it so difficult to configure because it's not something they actually encourage actively because unless it's something specific it's you know usually you don't want to undo you want to have some other mechanism in place to recover from your mistakes yes <laughs> Uh, not quite, but it's a bit like an accounting where you can't do an entry without another one, and you can't delete one without taking the other one with it. It's, it's a bit like that where if you make a change and somebody else makes a change, you're not allowed to change yours after that other one's gone in. That's just the rules, right? That last one in, theoretically, the last one in could be changed, but if you're talking about a server where there's thousands of transactions a second, no matter how fast you are on your undo button, it's never coming back. So just assume there's no undo, and that's life. You're going to live with it. And that's all there is to it. OK. So those are the four commands that have to do with DDL. Like I said, I don't go into it in detail because I gave you guys tutorials where you can actually see the syntax. And I found tutorials that are specific to Postgres. So it'll show you the Postgres specific stuff. Um, these tutorials are easy to read. They do a way better job than I could do up in front because it's in writing. The next one is the DML, which is the second part of the language. <clears throat> this part is what we're going to focus on almost exclusively for the next three weeks. Uh, the DDL you're going to learn in the lab. The DML you're going to spend an awful time in the labs doing it. Um, DML is where 98% of the work for database comes in. So for example, you've designed a database, good job. You've created a physical database, good job. You've used up 1% of what you need to do with the server. The rest of it is writing code to communicate with the database server to actually handle the data. That's why it's called a database. You deal with data. These are the commands that deal with the data. It's made up of four sort of five commands. And as I say, it's sort of made up of five commands because I'll explain um, why in a bit. Now, if you want to add data to the database, the command is insert. Often people will say, well, the command should be add. No, it's insert. Why? Because that's what the pocket protector decided. Now, anybody here ever actually do physical filing with filing cabinets? Okay. You know when you go to put a document in the filing cabinet? What's that called? You're inserting a frig off. You're inserting a file or inserting a document in the filing cabinet because you're usually inserting it between other documents. That's why they chose the word insert because it makes the most sense in the old filing ling lingo. You're inserting a document into a file, therefore... Let's add it. We're going to insert a value into the database. <laughs> update. Update means you're going to change the data. You're updating the values. Often you'll hit, uh, you know, you go to the dentist and they'll say, are there any changes to your contact information? If so, let's update your contact information. Same deal. You update the data in the database. Delete. Delete deletes the data. Right? You take your little piece of paper, throw it in the shredder, whoop, it's gone. Remember previously I just finished talking about how there's no undo? There it is. There's no undo to delete. So speaking as someone who's done this by accident, make sure you always put a filter on your delete. Because if you do a delete from users and you don't tell it what user you want to delete, they're all gone. So, yeah, delete's a little dangerous. Uh, select. Select is how you choose what data to see. Show me the data. It's a bit like when you go to the filing cabinet and you look through it and you go, I need that file. So you go and you select that file. Right? Not another word. <laughs> okay, so those are the four commands. Now, at the next lecture, I talk about insert, update, and delete. And I'm going to spend maybe 
15 minutes on those three commands. I will spend almost two and a half, three weeks on select. Just putting it out there. As you can tell, this is where the meat, you know, the meat of the language is. It's where all the magic happens. And then there's truncate. Now, truncate is like delete, but it's like comparing a pellet gun to a Gatling gun. The way delete works is it goes, I need to delete the records. Even if I do a delete and not specify what I want to delete, it'll go delete row, it marks number one is deleted, goes to row number two, marks number two is deleted, goes to row number three, marks row number three is deleted, on and on. On the other hand, truncate is like that scene in Men in Black. Poof! You don't remember anything you just saw. I kid you not, it's instant. One million rows of data gone in less than a, than a microsecond. What does it do? Is it basically tells the database server this table is empty and all this space that, that it has, you can do whatever you want with it right now. So truncate, yeah, be careful. It's a little dangerous. Um, now, some people always ask me, what would you use truncate for as opposed to delete? Delete is used to delete targeted data. You want to delete specific things in the database. So record number 5, number 10, number 12. Beep, 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 gone. Truncate is often used to clear a table before you do something to it. Often there, when you have an import routine where you import the dirty data into the database before it gets parsed into the right places, you'll have an import table. You truncate the table so it's empty, then you bring in the data so it's cleaned every time. That's pretty much the only time you use it during normal transaction processing. The other time it's used is when you're first populating a database. You put in some data, you realize you made a mistake, nuke it, try it again, nuke it, try it again. And depending on what database server you're using, Truncate has some extra ramifications. In Postgres, Truncate is just that. It just like, you know, hit the big red button and all the data is gone. Boom. Nothing else happens. It just resets the contents of the table. In MySQL, it actually modifies the structure of the table too, which is why it's sort of like an, why I call it kind of fire, but not quite. Because in MySQL, we have auto increment, sort of like what Postgres has, but it's done differently. When you do a truncate, it resets the auto increment to one. So you start at one again. So you nuke the table, it starts at one, two, three, all over again. With Postgres, it doesn't reset the counter. That's the difference. And this, this line is trying to get tedious. Every command is different. They all have a different syntax. It's terrible how there's a different syntax for absolutely everything. Now, sometime recently, some people have decided to try to make the insert and the update look similar. So they're using the update syntax with the insert statement and it's not catching you know you know that meme stop trying to make it happen it's not going to happen there's too many people that are ingrained with the old way of doing it that the new method's probably never going to take is it better i don't know but i'll be teaching you the old syntax because well that's what i'm going to teach you now could have been bad Okay, the insert statement looks as follows. The syntax is insert into what? The list of columns and the values that go into them. So, remember earlier I created a table called test? Insert into test. Name and active. Values, woohoo and true. As you notice, I did not supply ID. Why? Because it's the primary key it's set to automatically populate to the next number, so don't give it a value if it's an auto-incrementing field. You just name the fields you want to populate. You could have a table with 25 fields, but you only need to fill in four. You only, you only need to provide those four fields. You don't need to list out every column in the table. You just list off the columns that you're going to populate. Now, the other thing you've noticed, and I'm sorry about my quote, single quote marks. That's a Microsoft Office thing. Those are supposed to be single quotes. 
Um, strings and dates are quoted. Why would strings and dates be quoted? They can have spaces. So how do you identify a okay? How do you identify a string in Java? Quote marks, right? Actually, in Java, it's double quotes. If I remember right, single quotes mean something different. Well, in SQL, by standard, as single quotes are everywhere, uh, most or a lot of servers will accept double quotes instead. Postgres single quotes and only single quotes. Single quote, quotes work on all database servers. Double quotes don't always work everywhere. So get used to using single quotes. Because the second you try to use double quotes on a Postgres, you're going to get some weird message about an unknown object because it uses those double quotes for something else. As with the other commands, I've provided a link. Yes, it's for Postgres 9.5. This syntax hasn't changed since Postgres 7. So. All right, the update command. Do you change a row of data? Syntax is update table set key value pair. Then there's a where condition, which I'm not going to discuss very much till later. So update the table test set name equal to working, where the ID is equal to one. You guys are going to get familiar with the where clause at the next lecture. But this is what you use to filter out records. Remember I said the syntax is different, completely different from one to the other? There's your insert, there's your update. They don't even look the same. Why do they not look the same? Pocket Protector A was in room A and Pocket Protector B was in room B and they decided not to talk to each other. There's no reason why they couldn't make it look similar, they just chose not to. Which brings me to delete. Delete from whatever the table, again the where condition. Delete from test where ID is equal to 2. Row with ID of two is gone. No undo, no recovery, no coming back. It's gone. It's like going to the bank when the teller accidentally deletes your account. They're like, oh, shit. That's when they call the manager, you know. And then the manager calls his manager, and then they call IT support. And then, you know, you're in trouble. <laughs> Mostly at Scotiabank. Because <laughs> Scotiabank system actually allows you to do that. TD guy's laughing. <laughs> Does anybody here work at one of the, not one of those two banks I can pick on someone else? <laughs> and we're gonna step up. Ah, don't feel so bad. All right, so that's the syntax for delete. Like I said earlier, if you don't include the where statement, it's gonna nuke the entire contents of the table. And you're gonna go, go why is that command taking so long to run? Shit. It's usually the next word that follows that question. When you ask yourself that question, why is this taking so long? Especially when you're doing an update or a delete, usually the next word is shit. Well, actually, there's usually another word, but I can't say that one. Oh, yeah. But what, unless you're working with certain servers, it's gone. So if you work with MySQL and you interrupt the delete, everything you deleted up to that point is gone. With Postgres, if you're able to kill it in time, Postgres is pretty damn fast. If you're able to kill it in time, it will roll back the transaction because it treats every single command as a, as a self-contained transaction. Uh, I talk transactions later, but Postgres gives you a <laughs> tiny chance of recovering. But if you're working with a table that has you know less than 10,000 rows, there's no way you're going to catch it in time. Uh, last time I did a 10,000 row delete accidentally took uh, um, 0.4 seconds. And it wasn't the fastest computer in the building either. So that being said, yeah, get comfortable with restore. Again, I improved and included the syntax. I don't know what the syntax did past that example. That's pretty much straightforward. All right. Now. The last command is the select statement. And it's used to retrieve data. And there is an insane amount of syntax. I'm not even including a link. Because in the Postgres documentation, it's actually an entire chapter. It's not a page. It's a chapter. 
Uh, so, for example, if you go pick up one of those learning SQL books, the select statement occupies two-thirds of that book. Just putting it out there. Uh, why? Because that's where so much of the work happens. Is putting data in the database is easy. You just give it to the secretary and she puts it in the file. Now you need to go retrieve the data out of the thing. You have to tell said secretary. Notice I'm not assigning gender roles said secretary go get me all the files for somebody that for all the customers in Petawawa that owe us at least 500 bucks you know how much work she's got to put in to get that data out of that filing cabinet no she's got to scroll through the whole eh. oh. I said it with a Z H E okay she he thanks I was trying to avoid being assigning a gender role. He, fine, he, damn it. Now she made me blush. <laughs> and she's blushing too. <laughs> it's even better, she embarrassed herself. <laughs> um, oh, I collect myself here. Anyways. The given worker goes and retrieves the data. How much time they're going to spend digging through that filing cabinet trying to find that criteria you asked for, which is why we're going to spend so much time on learning how to use the syntax because the syntax is quite, at its most basic, it's really simple. That's it right here. That's the simplest SQL statement you can learn. Uh, did you guys do Hello World? Okay. This is SQL's version of Hello World. Actually, there's actually is a Hello World version of SQL. It, well, yeah, because you don't have to declare a class, you don't have to compile it. But you have to have a database that works. So that's a different thing. Yes? Uh, with these things here? Yeah, though, that's, um, that's my way of denoting uh, places where you substitute. Yeah, just like this. Select from test. I'm saying here, select from table. And I'm using tags around the word table just to show, you know, this is an object that goes here. So if I, if I jump back, here you'll see, right? Update, update, tables, test, set, set, whatever the field's called, to a value, where, and then the conditions. Okay. Oh, hey, it even popped up in the right place. That's amazing. Now, this is going to be kind of weird because I'm using a mirrored screen here, so. Okay. I just created myself an empty database just so I have something completely clean to work with. So for those of you guys, when you start working with PG Admin, essentially, what the, here's the quick two-second tour. Once you've launched it, you get a list of servers. Now, the Windows guys, if you use the installer that I pointed you guys to, you all have this registration. The Mac users, I think I created it for you. If not, come see me at the next lab. Uh, you're going to have problems if you don't have access to your local server. Um, the other things you'll see in here, you'll see some syntax on this side. It gives you the preview of what will create the different objects. That's what's over here. The magic one that we want to play with is this one right here. Execute arbitrary SQL queries. And I click on that, and it looks like crap. There we go. We get this. Now I'm going to turn off the scratch pad because I never use it. In here is where we type in our commands. Remember earlier I was saying, you know, you type in your commands and stuff happens? Down here is where the output happens. So if I go... Now, earlier I said the language is not case sensitive, but you'll notice that I tend, not always, but I tend to make my... Um, SQL keywords uppercase. And then my database objects lowercase. Why? Because it makes it more legible. That's the only reason I do it. Um, a lot of code cleanup tools 
will do it automatically for you if you tell it to, like, you know, someone show to have a little brush to sweep it clean or whatever. Um, they'll do the SQL keywords uppercase and everything else lowercase. That way it's easier to read. Now, the other thing you notice I did right away is I opened and closed my brackets. Why? It's just good habit. That way you don't end up with weird errors of why do I not have this? So I'm going to create a table called, uh, the column called ID. I'm going to make it a, a serial. And it's the primary key, just like that. The next one is name. It's a varkar 50. I said it's not null. And the other one is active, which is a Boolean. And I also said it was not null. And the default is true. Now, Postgres is kind of clever with its Booleans. Because it'll accept true. It'll accept 1. It'll accept T. Yes. You should all have it. Uh, do you remember what password you set your server to run on? <laughs> Didn't I tell you to remember it? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. It's fine as being recorded. At least you'll have the version including me asking if you remember your password. I'm going to hit the run command. Here's what you get if you typed it in right. Query returned successfully with no results in 33 milliseconds. It'll show you the history of the commands you ran, so at least you can get back. I've had cases where students, you know, forget their commands because when you submit the work to me, I want a text file with all the commands in it. And they go, oh, shoot, I forgot to keep them. You can find everything in the history tab. That is until you close this and then the history goes away. It doesn't keep it forever. It just keeps it for your session. Um, the explain command, I'll, that, that you'll learn later. Uh, the data output, obviously, there's no data being output. It's just telling you it succeeded. Okay, so that's the create. I'm going to alter my table. Oops, speaking of not going uppercase. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to allow this one to be null. So I'm going to add a column. So that's what adding a column looks like. And it worked. It's great. Um, just show you guys what an error message looks like. I'll make a bad command. You'll get an error message that looks something like this. I can't make this window bigger, this chunk at the bottom. I can't make this bigger like I did the, the actual commands. It'll show you that there's a syntax error near something. That basically tells you somewhere before this, something is horribly wrong. Usually it's the thing that's right before it, but not always. All right, so I'm going to go... Earlier I did that, I said the simplest command is this, right? And I'm going to run this command. And I said run this command. I'm clicking on the wrong window. There. So earlier I said, you know, there's that's the data output. There's no data in my table yet. But these are the four columns I created. As you see, I create I just added the sort by and it's there. Now, actually, you're not supposed to quote that. All right, so there's a command that inserts the data. If I'm going to run this, and I get no error, as you can see, it ran in 11 milliseconds. It's really, really fast, as I'm just putting it out there. Um, other similar errors you're going to get, for example, I'm, I'm actually doing this to show you guys with some of the error messages you might see during the labs. 
I, I defined three columns I'm, inserti I'm inserting into, correct? How many values am I supplying over here? One. This is the error message you get if you screw that up. Insert has more target columns than expressions. It has more over here than over here. You have to have a matching set on both sides. So I'm going to change this again. So I'm going to change it to only insert into two columns. And this one will work because I allowed nulls in the last column. If I try to insert a value without a required column, such as this, and I go run, you'll get this error message. Null value in column name violates not null constraint. We said the name is mandatory, therefore if you try to insert something without the name, what do you get? An error message. The error message is fairly straightforward. It'll say you're trying to add a row without stuff that's required. And it tell, even tells you column name is missing. So I'm going to go back. And I'm going to include none of the other stuff. So remember earlier I made the active have a default value of true. So I'm just going to supply the name. So far, name is the only thing that's been required from the beginning. And I'm going to hit run. Once again, it worked. Now I'm going to go show you guys everything that's in this table. And I forgot to make everything uppercase. There, proof to you that it works lowercase. Now you can see here's the mismatch. This one I set it to false, but it didn't improve, include the sort by. This one I only included the name, but active had a default value. It put it in for me. Sort by allows nulls, therefore it's empty. That's essentially the insert statement. The update statement looks like this. Now, I'm going to run the update statement like this because it's the least destructive example I can run that dam doesn't damage data. Boom. Right here, I didn't put on a where clause on that. Didn't, earlier when I was talking about be careful when you run these. If you don't tell it specifically what you want to change because it's going to change everything. You know, it's almost like saying to your significant other, can you just, can you go paint? And they paint the whole house pink or blue because you didn't tell them what to paint. Or in my case, the whole living room baby chick yellow. I was trying to make a point. And then I discovered my wife liked it. I had to live with that color for the next five years. I hate baby chick yellow. <laughs> so, update test set sort by like that. So now if I go back and look Oh, I hit my caps lock. You can see I updated everything. They're all, all set to two. So that was a destructive update. Bad juju. If I set it to one, so I say I want to modify this one, right? The ID is equal to one. You'll see it'll say I affected one row, 12 milliseconds. So as you asked earlier, how, do I have a chance to undo? No. So if I go back to what I had, now you'll see that one was updated. Now here's a funny little quirk about Postgres. Do you notice the last one it updated went right to the end of the table? Didn't stay at the top, it went to the end. This is a Postgres exclusive feature. And it's a feature that's really irritating. But it's because of the way Postgres handles the data on the inside. Now, I told it to update some data. What it does, is it goes and says, okay, I'm going to go grab row number one. I'm going to change some values. But instead of actually changing row number one, what it does is it marks row one as being worked on. It copies it, makes the changes in the copy, applies the changes, and then marks the original row deleted. Why would it do that? Because if the server shits the bed, that's a technical term, halfway through doing a major update, 
The data hasn't been touched, isn't damaged. There's always a chance to recover the data that's been touched because it's being slowly updated. Now, there's a catch with that. The tables grow because all the old data is still there. Sort of like if you were in Windows and every single time you save a file, what it would do is it actually take the file, make a copy, make sure it's saved properly, then takes the old file and then marks it as deleted. But that space doesn't get re released right away. That space is still used. That's what Postgres does. So just so you know what's actually happening behind the scenes. It's the same thing with the delete. You delete the row, it's not really gone, but it's gone because you'll never get it back. But it's still in the table. It's just that that record is now marked as gone. And later on, when the, the automated processes come through and clean up the, the mess, then a little vacuum, it's actually called vacuum, comes through and sucks up all the dead rows. So, you know, it's one of those things. All right, so that was the, the insert, the update. Now, I'm going to do, I'm going to alter my table again. Now, somebody want to take a guess what this is going to do? Now, I'm getting rid of a column. Yeah, so that's the last column I added to the end that I kind of botched. And I hope I got the syntax right because I've been working my SQL at work for the last three weeks. So, over here, go. Okay, so I just deleted a, a column. It took 12 milliseconds. Um, if I was doing this on a table with a million rows, it would take maybe 16 milliseconds. Just putting it out there. Um, when you delete the structure of the table, it makes no difference to the server. It does not care. It's gone. And it's instant. So now if I go back and I go, I hit run, you'll see that column is now gone. It's like it never even happened. It's like magic. Actually, I'll put that one in uppercase because I want to scream it. Delete from test. Now, I'm going to be nice, and I'm going to say where ID is equal to 4, because I don't want to nuke the entire table. I'm going to go run. One row affected 11 milliseconds to nuke a row. It doesn't, you know, it's pretty quick. And if I go back to my select statement so you can see what's in here, now two rows are there. The rest of it is gone. No, Control-Z, undo. Remember I was talking about have no undo? you got to undo in the editor. <laughs> um, you can also go to the history and actually see every command you ever ran. Error messages and all. It even shows you when you made mistakes. See? So that's there. So the last one i got to show you guys. Actually, you know what? I'll do truncate first just for shits and giggles. So I'm going to do truncate, which I've warned you guys, truncate is destructive. And I go, go. 23 milliseconds. Now, there could have been 10,000 rows in there. It would still take 23 milliseconds. Just, you know, saying. Um, and I can go... One last time. It's gone. It's empty. That's what I'm saying. It's, if it's only a single command, you can you can omit the semicolon. If you're going to do like that, you need two. And if you don't put the semicolon, you get this error message. Syntax error. At this point, it gets really difficult to figure out what it is. Yes. No, truncate clears the structure, but it's still there. Drop. It says the relation, Postgres uses the phrase relation to, to identify an object that's missing. Essentially, you know, you took it out back and it's done. It's over. 
Um, there's nothing left after that because you've deleted the table. Now, actually, what I'm going to do is I'll do one better. I'm going to save the playback log for everybody's enjoyment. Now, if I remember it, I'll try to post it tonight on Blackboard. And you guys don't have this. No, you're never going to have this. Um, this is a slightly more complex table to define. As you can see, there's all kinds of stuff on this. This is actually a table structure for a timesheet system at work, which is why you're never going to have it. <laughs> well, actually, I could give you the table structure, not the data in it. And to do a quick example of how fast Postgres can be, oh shit, no, that's my working copy. All right, so you can see it counting in the corner. That just retrieved 17,000 rows in 1.8 seconds. Um, so this contains time, date, data. This is actually real-looking data. Um, that's how fast it's going to behave. Actually, on our servers at work, it's even faster. That's just because it's running on my local machine, which is not, you know, a server. Um, if I were to actually nuke the entries, uh, if I go, ah, oh, the hell with it. I got a backup. Is that what it's called, right? That's what I used. Yeah. Here's the truncate command. Whoop. Oh, I got a backup on the server. That's my local copy. The real server's over there. It's backed up nightly. So, so that's how fast that happens. So. That's showing you how fast the truncate is. So I was 17,000 rows went. <laughs> that's actually right here. See this button that's grayed out right here? That's the stop command. Eh? Yeah, pretty much. Um, uh, I don't think I've got a, I don't think I've got a t Shit, do I have a backup on my machine? I don't know if I got a copy of my machine. <laughs> Good question. Uh, oh, I do. Hot diggity damn. Oh, by the way, this database is 252 megs. Um, so... And that's how long it takes to nuke an entire database. How that ran in 384 milliseconds. That's a year and a half worth of data entries. Okay, now I gotta restore it. Uh, Oh, do I actually have a, rec a more recent backup? Oh, you're so lucky. Give it a second. It's thinking really hard. Thinking. Yeah, it's the 252 megs of data. Usually it doesn't take that long. That's a little disconcerting. Hard drive light is not flashing. That's kind of weird. Why are we not responding? Restore again. Oh, it's gone. Oh, it is. Uh, as long as you don't botch it. 
Um, I'm going to actually go one step past that. I think what was happening was an ownership thing. Um, yeah, no problem. Oh, yeah, it's jammed. That's why it wasn't working. I should it actually do it earlier? Oh, it did restore it. It was just stuck trying to show me that it restored. Okay, so you want to know what the difference is between the delete and the truncate? So that was 394 milliseconds last time. 32 milliseconds. Um, the last time I don't know why it actually took that long because it normally wouldn't. It took 98. So if I was working with a larger data set, the truncate would be faster. 17,000 is nothing. It's just a blip. So, okay. So I'm going to call it quits here. We're, don't forget, guys, don't forget about the test. I will send out a reminder usually <coughs> the day before it's due. Th try to get into your groups in the next couple of days. Create a group in Blackboard. <coughs> hey? Winter? This course. <laughs>